Sarah Witcher's Story, Chapter 6, A Stranger with a Dream. As soon as the sun came over the mountains on Thursday, promising a fourth day of fine weather, the search was resumed. A few of the men who lived at a great distance had to return to their own duties, but their places were taken by Ma and the three Witcher boys. No doubt was in their minds, especially in Little John's, that this was the day Sarah would be found. When they started out, Little John was dragging behind him the cart with its pine slab wheels. The ground is so rough, son, Pa said. There's bushes in many places, often stumps. When we go high, there will be rocks. Much of the way, there will be no bridle path to follow. Could be she'll be tired and want to ride. It could be, and she will, on our shoulders. My shoulders, Pa? She'll have her turn with each of us. Little John trundled the cart over to Betsy and offered it to her for the day. She was pleased. It would make up for her not going off with the rest of the family. Ma had put her in charge, not only of baby Henry, but of the cabin. You're needed here, Betsy, and Ollie will stay by to help you. Yes, Ma. Mrs. Patch and Mrs. Richardson, each one with a small child, had come to the cabin to prepare food and to have all in readiness for the searcher's return. Betsy stood beside them. They watched the party go off, dividing at the ridge as they had other days, each group taking a different direction. Faint and far away grew the sound of horns, but the sound was always in the air, like a low moaning wind. I'd like to be with them, Mrs. Patch said. Mrs. Richardson agreed. But somebody's got to keep the fire and see to the food. Betsy tugged at Mrs. Patch's skirt. Once upon a time, I found a four-leaf clover in the pasture, she confided. If they'd let me go along, I could find my sister. She lifted her head. I'm sure I could. Bless you, child, but it would take more than four-leaf clover eyes to find her. She put her arms around the little girl, sensing her need for comfort. Then she released her with a sturdy shove. Let's get to our work, for we've all got something to do. Betsy, fetch buckets so we can have water we need, then take care of those children so none of them get too near the fire. That toddler of mine is apt to go almost anywhere if you don't keep an eye on him. Betsy got the buckets, then she tied Ollie to a cart, piled the two visiting children in with a baby Henry, and went off to a shady place by the pasture wall. She had a fund of stories to tell and some songs to sing. When the little ones began to get restless, Ollie helped to keep them entertained. When he swung his tail, the children played with it as if it were a rope. When he lowered his body, they climbed up onto his back. The two women sat on the bench by the cabin, fingering through the bushel of beans for bits of shell or stem. When the water in the cauldron over the fire came to a good rolling boil, they tipped the beans into the adding a large chunk of salt pork and a dozen or more onions. That'll be a tasty mess five hours from now, Mrs. Patch said, as they watched the big brown bubbles form closely and then break away. There may be those without the heart to eat. I hope not. I'd like to think that success will be theirs today, and they'll return with appetites worthy of all we've got in this cauldron. My man says that child couldn't have survived one night in the forest, leastways four. The day may be warm enough, but the nights can still chill the marrow out of your bones. And what did she have on but a little thin cotton dress? Mrs. Patch made no comment. There isn't any one of all those men out scouring the mountain day after day who believes she'll be found, alive that is. Yes, there is, Mrs. Patch was quick in her reply. John Witcher. Well, he's her father. When it was almost noon, the children were summoned and fed. There was cold mush remaining from the morning meal and plenty of milk. The aroma from the cauldron was beginning to penetrate the air, and Betsy sniffed excitedly. Will we be having beans, too? Yes, child. There's enough to feed 40 men, but they won't all want to eat hearty. When Mrs. Richardson started to gather the children up to get them into the cabin for a rest, she included Betsy, who objected. Ma put me in charge. I'm staying here with you. 
So she did, but you'll do better later on when we'll be needing your help if you have a mite of rest now. Come along. Neither one of us will move from this bench by this cabin until we're all awake again. It won't be any time after that before the men will be back. With Sarah, it was not a question, so Mrs. Richardson did not answer. Soon the children were tucked under a quilt in the big bed. Henry fit into the space between Betsy's slight body, as he did against his mother's more ample one, so the patch baby could have use of the cradle. Ollie stretched across the doorway. They'll be quiet for an hour or more. Then they'll be wanting something to eat. They can have a taste of the pottage. The two women sitting on the bench and leaning back against the rough wall of the cabin took what rest they could. The sound of the horn still echoed through the forest and from hill to mountain, but so accustomed had they become to it that it was no longer even heard. Another sound caused Mrs. Patch to open her eyes drowsily. Nailed boots were striking on stones in the path. Was it another man coming to join the search, or one of the searchers returning with news? A few moments later, a young man came down the ridge and into the clearing. Neither woman had to look twice to see that he was a stranger. A leather sack over his shoulder proclaimed him to be a wayfarer. He may be wanting directions, Mrs. Richardson whispered. He's a beanpole of a man, Mrs. Patch added, and he looks mile-worn. They remained quiet as he came across the clearing to stand in front of them. I've come from Plymouth, he said. His words were weary, uttered through parched lips. A foot? That's close to 30 miles. He nodded. Where are you bound? To find the child. The child? Both women gasped. Give me some food and water, for I'm faint with hunger. Then show me the bridle path to the north. You've come to find Sarah? Mrs. Richardson asked. If that's her name. I hope you know these mountains. He shook his head. I've never been this far north before. The two women exchanged glances. When Mrs. Richardson spoke again, and tartly, when 40 men who know the mountains as well as they know their own clearings can't find Sarah Witcher, how is it you think you can? Please, kind ladies, I've walked from Plymouth. I've not stopped for rest or food along the way. Give me something to eat. "'Tis a best of beans cooking for the men's supper," Mrs. Patch said as she fetched a bowl, then ladled a generous portion into it. "'This'll put strength into you. Sit down now and eat." Mrs. Richardson handed the young man a noggin of water. "'It's the last day for the search.' He took it and bowed slightly to each woman. "'My name is Heath,' he said, "'and I thank you kindly.' Shifting the leather sack from his shoulders, he leaned it against the cabin. Then sat down on the bench. The noggin of water was drained and refilled before he turned himself to the bowl of bean pottage. I doubt that they'll find Sarah now, Mrs. Richardson shook her head sadly. Not even her little body or any tatterns of her clothes, but there'll be a good meal waiting for them when they get back. I shall find her, Mr. Heath said quietly. You? When he had finished, he set the bowl down on the bench, shook his head at the offer of more and said, last night, when I walked into the inn at Plymouth, I heard talk of a lost child. I prayed that she would be found, and when I went to bed, I dreamed of finding her. A dream? Mrs. Richardson exclaimed. Then she burst out laughing. It'll take more than a dream to find Sarah now. And we'll take a break here and finish this chapter a little later. This Tigger says ta-ta for now. Hope you guys are liking this story. Love you. Bye-bye.